Los Angeles, a place where people come to search for dreams, but all too often they're shattered before they even get the chance. I came here in search of my own dreams. To try the food. To meet the locals. But most importantly, I came for video games. And I wasn't gonna stop until I played them all. Let's roll. Have a good show here at E3. Thank you very much. Nice Thank you. Time. It's day one of E3, and to kick things off, it's a Microsoft press conference. I hope you enjoy the show. That's killing in motion. This is a huge E3 for Tomb Raider. With Smart Glass, you can watch a show on your TV and your tablet will indulge you with related content. And Xbox Smart Glass works with all the devices that you already own. How many times have you been watching an episode of South Park and thought, I'd like to be able to watch this on my television while hooked into my mobile device, which is being controlled by my tablet device, which is hooked into my oven, all while sitting in the refrigerator? <laughs> Dead Space 3 will take players on the most immersive, spine-tingling adventure yet. This new deepest, richest Sin City experience ever. This year, with Medal of Honor Warfighter, we're going global. This is a revolution. Well, Ubisoft and Sony have shown us some new IPs, which is exciting, with the open-world hacking of Watch Dogs. Every citizen's darkest secrets will be at your fingertips. And the creepy telekinesis of Beyond. Oh, and there was Wonderbook, too. Wonderbook puts a physical book in your hands and supports a new range of experiences that bring stories to life in your living room. Ah, butterflies. Oh yeah, Mario time! You, you play the Superman, good idea. I did a little power snap. We decided that our next system was going to have its own dedicated screen. That's the press conferences done and dusted. Now, let the show begin. Borderlands is all about the loot. And, and few games nail that carrot on a stick thing, but Borderlands gets it right. What do you think is key to keeping people uh, wanting that next bit of purple? There's a lot of psychology to it, actually. We did a lot of homework before we got started on Borderlands 1. We were studying uh, reward psychology. We actually studied gambling, the psychology of gambling a lot. Uh, now, Borderlands is not a gambling game. Our goal wasn't to get motivate people to put money into a slot machine. Our goal was to reward people for, the, for their investment of time. Set your goal, mission accomplished, Shagoff. They're putting time into it, exploring this incredible world, and having fun playing online with their friends. And so we wanted to figure out a reward schedule that would pay that off with the delivery of loot. We're going to need a lot of guns. We've done a lot of work to make sure that we can render more enemies than we've ever been able to render on screen. And it's back to basics, it's back to sweaty, fast-paced gameplay. And the game, I have to warn you, if you're not playing it on casual, it's hard. I think we want the game to ask something of gamers. We want them to actually really have to try. We want them to have to scrounge for ammo. We want them to be down at their last clip and almost die in a lot of the combat scenarios, and in fact die occasionally and try a new strategy because that's what makes a game challenging and difficult. Why do a different type of forts again? One of the things that you know we really wanted to do was bring an entirely new experience to the Forza world. Really show a different way to enjoy those those wonderful cars. And for us, that's taking these cars out onto the open road where they belong. In Forza, the car is the star. So we could absolutely never, not that we'd want to, change anything about that. What we've been able to do, and this is really down um, to the skill of our artists and of our engineers, 
um, is build a world which really matches the beauty of the cars. Here comes the cavalry! Tell us about the art direction on this game. Realism, this is what it's all about. Um, you know, that means you have bright days and you have very dark nights and uh, we have them all. Technology has always been a big part of Splinter Cell. You know, all the vision modes, these things that uh, we brought back, uh, they're, they're sort of, you know, much prettier, uh, much more functional versions of, uh, of the same technology you had before, so. Getting around the place looks much more evolved than any other Splinter Cell. It's really not just about um, combat, but it's about moving fluidly through the environment. It's one button. You, you get to, to hop over things, uh, you get to slide under things, uh, and you get to mark and execute uh, along the way as well. Uh, and it's not easy by any means. Uh, uh, it's super difficult to, um, to master. Welcome to fourth echelon. choose this particular time period to set the game? Uh, Assassin's Creed is uh, about pivotal moments of uh, the history. We really believe that uh, the American Revolution is a great setup uh, to bring up, you know, an emerging uh, political stakes that uh, the Assassins and the Templars are going to fight for. Uh, it's about power, it's about uh, political and government uh, battles. So it was for us one of the perfect scenarios. Tree climbing was uh, really something we wanted to explore for the franchise. Um, we succeeded right, to nail it, it took a lot of effort, but I, I believe the experience okay. is really fluid and very organic. Cells dividing their forces. It's your call how you want to do this. The first part of the demo is uh, much more like Crisis 1. You have like these multiple paths that are all connected, both uh, horizontally but also with paths that goes up. And um, it's, it becomes a great playground, especially with the bow that we added to Prophet. Uh, we we're, we're, we're literally pushing the theme of him being the hunter within this urban rainforest. And that is exactly what people are doing in that area. And then we have the, the dam area afterwards, which is more like a humanly created uh, uh, kind of technological playground, if you will, that is. Uh, that has multiple pathways as well, but it's still very different in the way you play it. It's much more just, you know, go balls out, shoot everything. It's what it kind of encourages you to do. adventure game in an open world, and the adventure part is definitely crafted into a detective type of structure. And it appears as to have that structure to tap into people's lives to learn what's going on. So you're going to be able to dismantle the corruptions of Chicago. <laughs> if I ask myself, like, if I wasn't visible, where would I want to be to listen to people talking when they're offline? Let's go invisible anywhere you want and start listening to what the truth is behind. All right. From a vision standpoint, what we asked ourselves is, how can we be more Michael Mann than Michael Bay? It should be more about the human drama. If we cause an accident, there's people up behind the wheel. It's not about like saying, oh, awesome, an accident. But also, what happens to those guys? Can I do something about it? What the media will think about that? Like, people will watch me do those things. So all of those things become relevant. We're in the city of Dunwall which is a non-existing place in fiction, which is brand new. It doesn't have a real geography, it doesn't have a real time period. We add two elements of science fiction that take it more into the late 19th century, early 20th century, and, and magic, and magical powers and mysticism. So you have these three main things, realism, magic, and science fiction. You are uh, somebody who's uh, wrongfully accused and who wants his revenge, who wants to um, punish an evil dictator, the regent, and set things right. And you can use all of these aspects of the world and the universe to achieve your goals. It's a very dense experience, so you can go into one room on one building, 
and explored and played in so many different ways. And then there are stories within the story, what's happened last week, what's happened 10 years ago, and you can discover these by clues that are implemented in, in the world. things we love about Lara is that that indomitable force of will, right? That that ability to do whatever it takes. And this is something that we actually took from real survival stories. The first rule is is just not give up. No matter what you're dealing with, you have to go on. It was important in starting with her uh, you know, the beginning of her story to make sure she started as a grounded, relatable human, a young female. And this is her first big adventure. But we also had to ask ourselves, you know, what does it take to become a Tomb Raider? So a lot of, uh, a lot of the challenges that she faces and the abuse that she takes is, is really first to highlight that she really is out of her element. People know who they want her to become and to start so different than that and see her slowly progressing towards that is, is what makes it uh, a fun story. It's been a long day. I need to play Halo 4. The Chief, he's back. Uh, he's been through a lot. He's somewhat lonely character, just historically, and Cortana's his best friend. And uh, it's really gonna be a story about their relationship. And it's not as simple as a love story or just a story of friendship. It's actually a brand new kind of relationship. It's a, a human and an artificial intelligence that has real feelings, that has a, you know, for want of a better word, a soul, and uh, the, the chief is loyal to her and she to him and, and seeing how that loyalty is strained by uh, the conditions they find themselves in. But also, it's kind of going back to Halo's roots. It's a story about exploration, the forerunners and their long vanished civilization and we're gonna go really deep into that. Making any big change, particularly with multiplayer in Halo, um, is a huge decision. Halo gameplay is about balance, it's about the sandbox, and those are things that can't change. And so then it really became, you know, how do we allow players to have a little bit more freedom with what they choose and how they want to play? So it's less about being able to bestow this pile of things that work better on a player and more about giving a player more choice so they can really start to, to customize their loadout and how they play to suit their style. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good game. This is the Nintendo floor, and while we have Pikmin 3 and Rayman Legends and Just Dance, really the cues here are for the hardcore games, because I think people really want to see how Nintendo are going to bring that hardcore audience back. Plus, zombies are awesome. I'm gonna analyze this for science. Oh, I'm down. Oh, it's pretty tough. And I'm dead. I like permadeath. Well, this is the Wii U controller, and at first I thought it was a bit weird. You know, it looks a bit clunky, but actually in my hands it feels quite good. It feels like they've grabbed a normal PS3 controller and stretched it out. So the touchscreen seems fairly responsive, and it's a really nice, uh, crisp resolution as well. It takes some getting used to. I'm finding I have to look down at the controller and look up, um, but uh, I think it works. It's also got a speaker inside it, so you're hearing things happening here as well as on there. He's guiding you. Gonna get you. Turn around the outside, come through the trees, you'll never see me. Stealthy, stealthy. Oh, no! Oh, no! <laughs> Controller here is my map, is my navigation map, so it's a bit hard to look down there and then look up, but it's actually quite nice, because then you don't have that map on the screen cluttering it up. I've reached my destination. And I'm actually using the gyroscope in the controller to scan for the guy I need to get, I think. For the first time ever, Mario is now in high definition. So I'm actually playing Mario. I can play it on the screen, or if somebody wants to watch TV, I can just play it on the controller. Oh, no, oh, no. Oh. Yahoo! So now I'm, I'm helping them out. 
by tapping little blocks. I'm helping out the other players, or trolling them. I'm also trolling them, but I'm also getting rid of their, their enemies. I'm gonna put some blocks up here and troll this guy. You're going down, Luigi. I've decided to rename the Wii U controller to the Troll U controller, because I'm just trolling. <laughs> you are! Ah! <laughs> you mean it! I'm trolling with my eyes closed. <laughs> I think the first question everybody always asks us is, you know, why would I pick anybody but Superman? And so we, we do have to do something to make you want to play another character. And so we actually do have something in the story that we're going to be explaining in the next few months that will kind of make it all make sense. But then we also really wanted to have a dramatic difference in the style of gameplay. So a, guy, a character like Batman is what we're calling a gadget character. He uses the background objects completely differently than Superman would. And so the mixture of these classes of characters and the objects that you can use throughout the background and how they use them is really what kind of mixes up the whole fighting game uh, mechanic. Because our studio has done Mortal Kombat, there's always parallels that people will be associating with it. You know, like everybody will ask us, you know, are there x-rays in the game? Are there fatalities in the game? Are there, you know, friendship, babalities? All, all these kind of crazy things that we've done over the years, but we're probably replacing overt violence that we had in Mortal Kombat with just over the top scale of things. So you're punching people into outer space, you're running around the world, you're doing things that are just so, you know, over the top in terms of their size and scope. That's kind of like this game's identity. Mortal Kombat 9 was a refused classification in our country. I haven't been able to play it. And I was wondering if I could get a hug <laughs> because I haven't played Mortal Kombat 9 and this makes me very sad. <laughs> you can get a hug? Can I have a little hug? Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> Kratos is such a, an angry, arrogant, tough character. Where is he at at the start of this game? He's messed up. He's, he's, he's actually kind of going insane a little bit from the Furies. He's searching for his way and trying to figure out, you know, how to kind of right the wrong and break free from his oath. Why did you put multiplayer in the game? <laughs> Simply. Um, we wanted a different challenge. You know, last game we did Titans. Previously, we did Pegasus. And, and first one, it was really just about coming up with what God of War was and, and has evolved into. Um, so this one, we decided to, to branch out and try something new. Souls. Well, we're not in the clear, right? Not while we're in this city. The relationship between Joel and Ellie is, is a complex one. Uh, Joel and Ellie are not father and daughter, but they have a father-daughter-like bond. Posters are everywhere. Joel is a survivor who has lived through the outbreak of the plague that decimated society. Now, government has collapsed, cities are abandoned, nature is retaking the world, and there are just small pockets of survivors here and there fighting to stay alive. Ellie grew up there. She was born there. She doesn't know anything but this world. Joel has experienced extreme loss. Everyone he knows, everyone he loved is dead. And he's now crossed pretty much every moral line he ever had to cross. He now is, is burdened with somebody who he has to care about, having really shut down all of that. He's teaching her more and more skills of survival. And as he does so, he finds his own redemption through her. And she finds a protector through him. And so it's all about this, this bond between them in this harsh, brutal world. Nobody wants to babysit. No one wants an escort mission. You want somebody who is always an asset to you. And that's what we're really focusing on with Ellie, is that you, you feel that without her, the game would be much harder, you know? She's always there taking care of herself, getting out of the way, making sure that enemies won't see her. But then when you need her, she's there. She's there to throw the brick at the guy. She's there to be your ally and your help. Grimlock, Grimlock. Smash. 
Matt, you were the game director on War 4 Cybertron. Uh, thank you very much for giving Transformers the, uh, the game they deserve. Thank you. Would you mind thank if I give you a little hug? Just to say thank you. <laughs> you got it. Tell us about Grimlock. So Grimlock is a phenomenal character for a couple reasons. One, story-wise, he's beloved by Transformers fans, right? I mean, he's one of the most popular Transformers of all time. Super powerful, and he is really the only guy, he's an Autobot, right? He's a good guy, but he's the only one who does this with Optimus Prime. He will lock horns with him about whatever the issue is. And it, it's really cool for showing how great Grimlock is. He's a brawler, he has a giant Energon sword and shield, and he wades through enemies, he's like twice as big as everybody else. And so, you, so gameplay-wise, it's so fundamentally different, it's gonna make you kind of change your tactics. The Tyrannosaurus Rex, it is awesome. I don't care if you like Transformers or not, I think any gamer's gonna wanna stomp around, chewing people up, and shooting fire out of their mouth. Grimlock, where you been? Tell us about how you're structuring the world in this Spider-Man compared to Shadow Dimensions. Well, one of the big differences uh, between Shadow Dimensions and this game is that we're bringing Manhattan back. So we are giving you free roaming. The fans have been asking that for four years now, actually, since the last free roaming Spider-Man game. So we're now giving it back to you, but not just a, not just your regular Manhattan, like a new and evolved version of it. We've actually had to rewrite large parts of our technology just to be able to throw what you're going to see on your on your screen. Whoa. I can see that alien's crouch. Mark, firstly, on, on behalf of Australia and all the COD fans, thank you for Black Ops. It was amazing. <laughs> can I give you a Thank hug? you, guys. You can. You can. <laughs> so why take, why take Black Ops 2 into a slightly future presence, and why? what does this open up for the gameplay for you guys? Well, I think that's it. It does. It opens up a lot of a great new gameplay. It's not only about the technology and the gadgets and the weapons that you can play with, but suddenly those are also new enemy types or AI that you can play against. We love telling a great story. We love doing character development. Um, we enjoy doing that for Black Ops. And, you know, building off of that, we wanted to add um, choice elements. I mean, we're an interactive medium, and we wanted to be able to bring that to our storytelling, not just have a, a linear story. Make that story more your story. We're going to open up uh, some of the gameplay, particularly with these strike force levels, where you're gonna have these sandbox gameplay elements and things like that. give the players more opportunity to express themselves through the gameplay, and especially in terms of uh, the animations for the characters. So we're really concerned with how we can show different types of horror elements in this game. The older Resident Evils, the only time we were really able to scare the player, show these things, is by just having them walk down a hallway and then something jumps out at you. So we want to be a little more reactive, a little more intuitive in terms of gameplay. In this time out, you can walk and shoot. So we've uh, developed the enemy AI to be more aggressive in certain ways. So now uh, you'll be in, put in different situations that you weren't be able to be put in Resident Evil. For example, now like uh, you can be on the ground, you can roll away from enemies, and so you're shooting at them. And they're gonna try and jump on top of you and try to eat you while you're there. So those intense moments are still part of the game. They just take a different form because we have new yeah. gameplay. Thank you very much from all of the Resident Evil fans in Australia. Speed. Need for speed. We need to go check out Need for Speed. Let's go see Need for Speed. Oh, it's a beautiful open world. Look at that. That's gorgeous. We were learning a lot from Paradise. In Paradise, we had eight finish points for all of our races because we knew that it, you know, it can be quite difficult to navigate in an open world. There's always a wrong junction and a right way. So this time, we've, we've actually built purpose-built the city and its road network to facilitate the, the building of circuit races. So you'll see common things in racing games like chicanes and hairpins as part of the road network. But these, these form a flowing natural circuit which you don't need chevrons to funnel up layer around. It, they'll, they'll naturally know the routes as they drive. I like to think if the racers in the city got together, if it was a real place, they'd, they'd create these routes because they're natural and they have a nice flow. We've, we have some rules like we'll never turn left or right at a junction. It's always straight across and we purpose-built the world for those. 
So what, it's so hard to do open world uh, racing. The checkpoint systems are really tough and confusing, but you can tell where you need to go here. The way they build the world, I can tell already that they've really thought hard about it. Uh, I missed a checkpoint. No, <laughs> I take it all back. <laughs> We had done the whole, you know, out in space, which is awesome, and still coming back for, you know, obviously for Dead Space 3. But on the first one, you're on the interior of the ship. Dead Space 2, you're on the sprawl on the space station. But we thought, let's go onto a planet's surface. And what better, you know, fits with Dead Space than an icy, cold, hostile environment? And that's what we created with the Tau Volantis, this ice planet. So it's not a friendly place. Even when you're playing with a buddy, you know, it's not going to make things that much better for you. You know, you still, it's, it's more of a way to share the experience with a friend. So if you still want to play in single player and want complete isolation, you, have, you totally can do that. There's not going to be a buddy follower with you connected at the hip at all times. You're on your own. The overall story stays the same and the overall, you know, narrative stays the same. But what will change is the interactions between you and this other character, John Carver. So you'll have more uh, personal experiences with the other guy when you're playing with him. And in single player, he'll still be a big part of the story, but he won't be with you all the time. I don't recall there ever being a mobile section at E3 before, and they've chucked out a pretty big slot of real estate here. So it just goes to show that it's big business and it's definitely on the rise. I found you by the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. Was there an accident? Telling a story in a game, it's, um, it's very difficult because in essence, usually games are used as patterns or in loops or in cycles using mechanics. So repetitive actions. And the focus has always been on physical actions. It's on violent actions in general. It's about killing or it's about destroying or it's about jumping. And my approach is very different to controls than most games out there. Most games are really based on adrenaline and skills and the fact that you can press the right buttons as quickly as possible and develop some technique. But I don't see games as a sport. I see them as a, an emotion simulator in many ways. I mean, it, it's, it's a way to emulate whatever can happen to you, the good things and the bad things, except it's just a simulator. It's not for real, but makes you believe it's for real. That, that's, that's my challenge. You wouldn't believe how many guys we meet telling me, oh, I played Heavy Rain with my wife and we played the game. This is the only game we ever played together and, and she loved it. And so that's great. I'm really proud of that because I think that women are probably more clever than we are. I mean, we can stay in front of the screen for hours shooting at zombies or monsters, but they can't because they need something deeper and something more emotional and something more, more interesting for them. Fifteen years ago, I saw the first real-time 3D games appearing and I thought, Wow, this is incredible. I mean, it, it's crazy. We'll be able to do incredible things with this new medium. Fifteen years later, I mean, the industry is still doing, you know, shooters and, you know, jumping on platforms and driving cars, which is great for, for a certain audience, but I still believe that there is much more we can do with, with real-time 3D and interactivity than what we currently do. Because next time, I'll kill everyone. I didn't start writing Beyond before I felt I had something to say. It's not just making a game for the sake of making a game. It was really about, okay, do I really, as a, as a writer, do I have something new to say or not? And uh, so it took me some time. Usually it, it takes me a year in the writing to, to come up with this idea of Beyond. Come on, Aiden. I think they get the message. It's a very different vibe to this E3. It's all serious business, and you get the impression that the industry as a whole are playing it very safe. There's a lot of shooters, there's not many new IPs, but let's hear from some other media from around the world and their impressions on this year's show. This year was a lot about hands-on gameplay and a lot of really guided, focused information as opposed to hype. But all the boots were really good, really impressive. Shooters do seem to be the most popular, as far as I can tell. From a gamer viewpoint, it's been a bit disappointing because, you know, most of us were expecting, like, a jump to next generation or new games. Um, I think games were definitely the highlight, you know. I think a lot of people were really looking forward to the new hardware. We got the Wii U, we finally got to play it for the first time. You've got the AAA going great guns, and then you've got the more independent stuff being a massive renaissance, whereas the middle stuff is being squeezed out, and I think all of the the publishers are really anxious about that. So they want to say, look, this game isn't middle, it's 
triple A. We can't everything can't be that. So I think there's a there's anxiety in in the hall, and it's it's, it's, it's building up to quite, quite tense experience actually. Well, that was E3 2012. My feet are sore, my voice is going, my brain is sore, but I've had a glorious time, and now I'm going to catch a plane. Watch out. But go, 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 home real, real soon. Go, 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 home real, real soon. Go, 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 real, real soon. Go, 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 go,